Okay, in this video we want to look at the notion of a cyclic subgroup of a group. So given any arbitrary group and any element of that group, we can define the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A by the following. So we put these angle brackets around A, that is a notation that we're using, um, and that is going to be equal to all powers of A as N runs through the integers, where by a squared, for instance, we need a combined with itself twice using the group group operation, be that composition of functions, multiplication, or maybe even addition. Okay, great. So the first thing that we want to show is that this is actually a subgroup of G. So we're going to do this with the subgroup test. So use the subgroup test which let's recall what that says. That says that H is the subgroup of G if and only if for all X and Y in H, X, Y inverse is also in H. So that's the subgroup test. It's a really nice tool for showing that something is a subgroup in one step. So what we want to do is suppose we have two arbitrary elements X and Y in A, so what that tells us is that x uh, is equal to a to the m and y is equal to a to the n, where m and n are some integers. Good. But now let's calculate what x, y inverse is. So that's going to be a to the m and then uh, a to the n, the inverse of that. But then by exponent rules, which hold in a group, that's going to give us a to the m times a to the minus m, which is a to the m minus n. But notice, this is an element of our would-be cyclic subgroup a, and that's because m minus n is an element of the integers, given that m and n is an element of the integers. So what this tells us is that a is a subgroup of G, and I should say this cyclic subgroup generated by A, it is in fact a subgroup. So we are right to call it a cyclic subgroup. Okay, good, I'm gonna clean up the board and then we're gonna prove um, a related proposition. Okay, so the next result we wanna prove is that this cyclic subgroup A is the smallest subgroup of G containing A. So you might think, well, what do I mean when I'm talking about smallest in terms of subgroups? And in general, whenever you're talking about smallest in terms of things that are sets and subgroups, are, your ordering is not given by the number of elements, but your ordering is given by inclusion. So here's what we wanna show want to show that if H is a subgroup of G with A is an element of H, then the cyclic subgroup of A is contained in H. Okay, good. So that's what we're going to want to show, and uh, we can do that quite easily. So let's suppose that H is a subgroup of G with um, A being an element of H. But now notice that uh, that tells us that a to the n is an element of h for all n in z, and that's because subgroups are closed under the operation of the group, whatever that operation is, including taking the inverse, which accounts for the negative integers. But now notice, um, every element of the cyclic subgroup is a to the n for some n. So what that tells us is that the whole cyclic subgroup is, in fact, not just a subset of H, but it's a subgroup of H. So that makes, makes H larger than A, which tells us that this cyclic subgroup generated by A is in some ways the smallest subgroup containing A. And this finishes the proof. Okay, I'm going to clean up the board, then we're going to look at a bunch of examples of cyclic subgroups. Okay, so now let's look at some examples of cyclic subgroups. So let's first take Z and then maybe look at the cyclic subgroup generated by 5.
And so now here our operation is addition. So instead of having a to the nth power or five to the nth power, we're going to do repeated addition, which would be n times a or n times five. So in fact, what that means is that this is five times n, where n ranges through all of the integers. And that's just because we're doing repeated addition here instead of repeated multiplication. But recall that when we're talking about arbitrary groups, we generally talk about uh, multiplication. So, but notice that is exactly equal to a subgroup that we've seen before, which is called 5z. Um, and now notice this could happen for any uh, integer z. We could make this um, n z type subgroup, if you will. Okay, great. Now the next one I want to look at is maybe Z12. So this is the integers modulo 12 with addition. And now let's maybe uh, take the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. So notice that's going to contain 0, 4, and then we can do 4 plus 4 equals 8. And then 8 plus 4, which equals 12, but 12 is 0 within Z12. So here we just get this subgroup 0, 4, 8. And we can check that that's closed under the operation, has inverses and everything. And so that is, in fact, a subgroup. So here we have uh, a nice example. So now let's do maybe Z12 and look at the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. So we'll always have 0, and now we're going to have 5. 5 plus 5 is 10. 10 plus 5 is 15, but that's the same thing as 3 uh, modulo 12. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 plus 5 is um, 13, but 13 is the same thing as 1 modulo 12. And then 1 plus 5 is 6. 6 plus 5 is 11. Um, 11 plus 5 is 16, but 16 is the same thing as 4 modulo 12. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 plus 5 is 13, which is the same thing as 2 mod 12. Uh, 2 plus 5 is 7. And then finally, uh, 7 plus 5 is 12, which is 0 mod 12, and so that gets us back to this. So notice, that happens to be the whole group. Okay, good. So now, uh, I'm going to clean up the board, and then we're going to look at some other examples. Okay, so now for a few more examples. So let's look maybe first at U8. So recall that this is everything that is relatively prime to 8 with multiplication as the operation. So here we have 1, 3, 5, and 7. Those are the elements we have to throw everything else away because they contain a common factor with 8. So now let's uh, look at some cyclic subgroups here. So if we take the cyclic subgroup generated by 3, we're going to have 1, 3, 3, times 3 in this case, we're not doing plus anymore because this operation here is multiplication. So 3 times 3 is 9, but notice 9 is the same thing as 1, and so we have closed the group up. Great. So now let's do the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. So we're always going to have 1, that's like 5 to the 0 power. And then we have 5 to the first power, which is 5. 5 squared, which is 5 times 5 which is 25, but notice 25 is the same thing as 1 because we're working mod 8. So we get that right there. And then I'll let you guys check that 7 does the same thing. It just contains 1 and 7. And so this actually gives us a nice picture of U8 that we can draw a picture of the subgroups. Here we have the cyclic subgroup generated by 3, here we have the cyclic subgroup generated by 5, and here we have the cyclic subgroup generated by 7, and then all of these share the trivial subgroup, which is just the identity. And this is called a subgroup lattice for U8, and we'll look at something like this a bit later. Okay, good. So I'll clean up the board, and then again we'll look at another example. 
Okay, so for our next example, we want to look at the group of symmetries of the square. In other words, the dihedral group D4, which has eight elements. Let's recall that those eight elements are E, R, R squared, R cubed. We know R to the fourth is equal to one, uh, or the identity, I should say, because that's like four 90 degree rotations. And then we have S, which is some reflection, SR, SR squared, and SR cubed. So there are our four rotations and four reflections. So let's just recall that we've got this square going on, and maybe one of our reflections is about this axis, and then our rotation is 90 degrees. Okay, so let's look at some cyclic subgroups. So maybe the easiest one to look at is the cyclic subgroup generated by R. And this is given by the identity. That would be like r to the zero power. And then we have r, r squared, and r cubed. But notice if we take r to the fourth power, we get back to the identity. So we don't need to include that. Okay, let's look at another one. So let's do maybe the cyclic subgroup generated by r squared. So this is going to be equal to the identity. r squared to the first power, which is just r squared. And then we get r squared to the second power, which is r to the fourth, which is again back to the identity. Great. Now let's look at a uh, cyclic subgroup generated by s. So notice s is, we could say, maybe the reflection about this axis. So that's going to give us the identity, which is like s to the zero power, and then s to the first power. Notice if you do any reflection twice, you get back to the identity. So it's just those two elements right there. Okay, great. Let's do one more example maybe. Let's do SR. So we'll have the identity. We'll have SR. And now let's calculate SR squared. Now you might say, well, I know that that's a reflection already, so this should be the identity again. But just as a reminder for how this works, I think it's good. So this is going to be SR times SR. Good. But now if we want to commute these uh, past each other, that's going to give us S SR cubed times R using the rule for the dihedral group that whenever you commute r past s, uh, you pick up a r to the n minus 1 power. But now we have s times s, which is s squared, which is the identity, just like it was up here. Then we have r to the fourth, which is also the identity. So we can close this group up. So that's another cyclic subgroup of this dihedral group. Okay, good. So I'm going to clean up the board and we'll look at one more example. Okay, so for our last example, we want to look at the symmetric group. So maybe let's look at S5. And so let's recall that this is all bijections of uh, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have the cycle notation that we developed in a previous video. Okay, good. So let's first look at maybe the cyclic subgroup generated by 1, 2, 3. So this is going to be equal to the identity. That's like 1, 2, 3 to the 0th power. And then we have the cycle 1, 2, 3. And now let's do a little calculation down here. We want to do 1, 2, 3 combined with itself. That would be like the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3 squared. And notice that this is going to be, well, let's start with 1. Notice that as 1 passes through the first, we get 2, and then 2 passes through the second one, and we get 3. So that means that 1 is sent to 3. And now next, we have 3. Notice as 3 passes through the first, it gets sent to 2. Uh, sorry, it gets sent to 1. And then as it passes through the second, it gets sent to 2. So we get 2. And then you can check that 2 is going to be sent back to 3 for a similar reason. So we get 1, 3, 2. So we can write 1, 3, 2. And then the next thing that we can check is that 1, 2, 3 combined with itself 3 times is the identity. And I'll let you guys check that if you need to. Okay, good. So uh, I think this is a good place to stop this video.